Hello and welcome to Control Lessons in Procedural Destruction. My name is Johannes Wichter. I'm principal of the effects artist at Remedy. I used to work in film as effects supervisor and artist for more than 10 years, and I have moved into games um, in 2019. Now, I don't really have to introduce Remedy because it's quite well known already, but for the ones who don't, we are based in Espo in Finland, that would be up there. And uh, Remedy has been known for over 20 years for iconic uh, narrative-driven action. So Max Payne would be a thing, Max Payne 2, Ellen Wake, Quantum Break, and of course, not at least, most recently, Control. Um, introducing Control. Uh, Control is a supernatural third-person action adventure. And uh, you play as Jesse Faden, director of the Federal Bureau of Control, which you suddenly become right at the beginning of the game. And uh, you take over this government agency that is investigating that supernatural. Uh, the agenda for my talk today is, uh, well, I'm going to talk about the mission, the challenge that we have put out. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce sort of our core principle for a lot of the VFX that we've been doing uh, on control. So the principle of granularity, uh, I'm going to talk about workflow and implementation and then uh, highlight some lessons learned and a little bit of an outlook uh, on things that we probably would like to do better in the future. And uh, to start here, a little destruction breakdown, breakdown of control. challenges that we faced, uh, we're, a lot of the mission statement was about the location. So the whole game plays inside this government agency's building, which is a bit of a supernatural building. So they're mo the walls are moving and everything is a little bit different than, uh, than what you expect. And it's almost a character in itself. And um, it's key is sort of it's very, well, it's the brutalist architecture. It's very suitable for a government building. Um, and uh, another key was the believability, because it's a government agency. There are thousands of agents all about it, and it had to feel like a place that was sort of inhabited by so many agents that go you know, about their day-to-day -day work. Um, they have you know, telephones and coffee mugs and their coffee machines, and they have their desks and their places where they are in the different departments. And that was quite crucial to sell that and to tell that uh, story of that place. Um, the lighting had um, a very cinematic look to it, and that was the desired style. Um, control is very big on the whole RTX ray tracing, um, and uh, well, obviously the lighting had to cater for that and had to be quite cinematic. And uh, well, brutalism is all about exposed materials. So you have that boarded concrete, you have lots of wood and glass, and you know the the sort of very suitable agency building kind of style. Now, obviously, uh, when we talk about destruction, we talk about the haptics. So uh, we wanted to sell a rich, reactive environment conveying the sense of being able to consistently interact with anything inside it. And um, obviously limitations uh, are another challenge because uh, you know, we have target platforms we have to hit. So we were after a realistic rewarding physical impact and we were, no, go wild, create havoc wherever you go, but please don't do that all too much um, because obviously there's performance and memory that we have to hit and the AI requirements and um, well, we were a very, very small team to achieve all that. There's sort of an overarching um, principle uh, that I just coined, the principle of granularity. And that is really that uh, we decide to represent every level of natural detail and every effect that you create. And it's actually not a thing that's specific to what we did in Control. Um, this is also a very, very common principle for any VFX work for film. Um, you try to sort of capture nature because nature isn't quantified. Nature is sort of a continuum from very big objects down to dust and very, very thin veils of smoke and those kind of things. And all that you always want to, want to encapsulate to create this richness, uh, this rich gradient across all those different um, scales to it. Now, if you look at that, how to do this in a game engine, uh, we're looking at an overlapping representation in three different layers. And the first one is, well, you can do rigid body simulations. You have chunks and parts of props and props and environments, and all that is RBDs. And the environments are, you know, like a big static kind of mesh you can collide with, and objects are like chairs or tables. And then you've got to start maybe representing them with something else, because the smaller you get, the more of them you will have on screen. So we're now looking at something like mesh particles or rigid body hierarchies um, uh, or material decals even, just to sort of sell uh, a certain 
certain material richness uh, on those layers. Um, so we're now moving you know, from objects to chunks and almost into the debris already. And then the last layer actually is pure particles, particle sprite, mass particles uh, for ember, spark, smoke, fire, splinters, gravel, sand, all that kind of stuff that plays a big role uh, when filling, filling all that kind of gradient. Now, uh, for control, I, I chose this sort of particular angle uh, inside our research sector um, and uh, to sort of demonstrate the, the different aspects of this gradient, how we fulfilled it or how we filled it uh, in, uh, in our VFX work. And now what you're looking at here is the static environment. This is like all the stuff that can't actually move. And um, it looks like, okay, cool, you know, it's a bit empty and a bit vast. And then there's uh, sort of another layer and it's, it's a bit underrepresented in this particular angle, but you see like that the railings have been added, for example, and this would be sort of concrete parts of your environment that you sort of can interact with. And you actually see it's actually not all that much. It's quite surprising. And then the big difference uh, comes in when you start adding all the props. Um, and really for that kind of part, it, it just shows the, the richness the game had to sort of have in terms of like filling everything with bits that you can actually interact with and move, which are the props and all those kind of um, additional items that can be placed. And kudos to our environments team. They've done a marvelous job to sell uh, sort of the richness of the place by using all those kind of elements. And um, for our workflow, it was actually quite a standard thing how you would expect it. You have an environment build, you have environment artists that sort of provide level geometry modules, kits and props, and then uh, that goes into the VFX department for destruction setup, and we had a lot of systemic setups and prop rigs, and also there was cinematic animation for specific aspects of what we were doing. And that then goes into Northlight, which is our in-house um, engine, uh, where everything is sort of running on. And but we had to choose a certain approach to this and we went procedural. Um, and like, what does it mean? What does procedural mean? Everyone says, talks about it all the time. What does it mean? It's a rule-based processing and interpretation of world data. That's really all it is. You get some data and you have some rules. You apply the rules and change the data. That's sort of the, uh, the key of this. And how that looked like for us uh, in, for this kind of environment process, uh, well, we got the art models in the world and there was our data. And the data was actually amended or augmented with a bit of extra stuff, extra metadata that basically told us what everything is made of. So we could say, hey, those cushions are fabric and that concrete is well concrete and the plant is made out of plant. And uh, once you know that for an object, then you can start actually applying rules on those based on um, what those objects are made of. So you could say, well, grass spawns bits of leaves when you shoot it or concrete breaks into sort of smaller concrete bits when you shoot it and spawns dust. And you shoot a metal pipe, it spawns like a water that dripples out of the hole and then you add like a bend decal to sort of sell a little bit of a deformation on there. And you have a finite set of rules that sort of encapsulates um, that whole process um, and sort of makes sure that everything sort of has a reaction to whatever can happen in the world. And then that is fed into the engine um, and then the impact VFX and braving VFX and, and rigid body behavior that is sort of driven by the material and that sort of creates that interactable environment. Now, why would you do that? Why would you go procedural? Um, because setting all that up is a little bit uh, more difficult, a little bit harder than just sort of kind of doing it. But uh, the thing is you needed a, a consistent and fast turnaround and we also needed a predictable behavior within very clear defined matrix, uh, metrics. So we needed to know like how many things uh, something can break into, etc. And uh, we had hundreds of assets and variations. Uh, so at the top, in that top image, you kind of see like all kinds of building blocks that make out rooms and walls and pillars and concrete railings and all that kind of stuff and all the lots of, lots of astral plane things in there. And at the bottom you see a, a selection of props, which is like desks and toilet cubicles and walls and dividers and planters and plants and computers and telephones and all that kind of stuff. And we had so much of them, uh, but we only had a team for, well, you could say on average one to three people actually working on all of that. So we needed something that we could just unleash on certain things that come through the pipe. And when they're attacked in a certain way, something specific would happen to them that we have predetermined. But you couldn't do it per item um, because it was just not possible and it doesn't scale. Um, so if you look at the material driven behavior now, what you would want to do is on the left, you see the concrete, you know, you shoot concrete, concrete stuff happens and you um, look at the middle and that's sort of like wood, uh, uh, wood, when you shoot wood, it breaks into chunks or it breaks into those, the splinter pieces and then they're like splinters on the floor and on the right, you see what happens when you shoot glass and that's sort of like three different uh, uh, materials like demonstrated here. Uh, so the material-based interactions on dynamic objects and then you see the particles and decals sort of reacting uh, also to what the material is. And I'm going to go a little bit more into detail on this. 
so the first part of this is the geometry layer. Um, we are looking at a piece of railing here and it's made out of concrete at the bottom and then a bit of metal in the middle and then there's uh, a wood on top and from the left to right it's sort of you see a hierarchy of how that stuff breaks. Um, so you see level A that um, is uh, sort of broken up the concrete. It doesn't have decals on it because you don't want to see all the cracks when you break an object uh, and then you see the wood is sort of going on to longer kind of splintery things and the metal is a bit bent and then level B already doesn't have metal anymore. It doesn't break any further but the wood does and the concrete does and then even level C also optional uh, depending on the material would break even further and now it might look a little bit funny here because you're like oh that's like super regular kind of you know this like screams Voronoi right there but you got to imagine that you're not actually breaking all the parts of the object at all times so you're literally shooting a certain corner of it and that's where it would break into all the pieces now we had different simulation entities and this is like nothing new like we had rigid bodies that's just you know the physical objects that can be flying around the world and then we had a system that we called chunks and chunks could have bonds and really what that is that is rigid bodies that sort of share a compound collision um, in, in some cases it's called a composite some call it an aggregate it depends a little bit and then we were using drawings as regular and uh, so chunks as I just described chunks are sort of just a compound and they're created at initialization time so like those two things belong together and they share a collider and they sort of move as one until they break uh, so close proximity leaf nodes are basically bonded together and um, if you look at joins uh, they were just created on geometry hierarchy uh, based on a metadata description so this rigid body and this rigid body are connected by something like a revolute or a hinge joint to be a door or to be a, um, a drawer or you know whatever else we needed structurally to represent a prop or a part of the environment in the game. And um, they were dynamically breakable based, again, on an impulse strength. And there's something special about the breaking of the joints because uh, uh, internally, when you create uh, sort of a joint between two rigid bodies, what we actually wanted to do, we actually, actually did, is that we actually connected the two lowest level chunks uh, uh, inside of that, which essentially means that you can break a door um, and uh, there's a big hole in the door, but the door is still <laughs> attached to it on a hinge. It's not like that the joints would actually break as soon as the, the, the parent box, like the RB1 box, as soon as that breaks into parts, it wouldn't actually uh, fall off the hinges. It would stay on the hinges as long as the chunk that is on the hinges is still around. And that uh, actually allowed us to have a little bit richer interaction because you can punch a hole in the door and the door still opens and closes like a door, for example. And that, uh, uh, that helped to not create this kind of, you know, uh, fall apart on impact <laughs> uh, scenarios, but, uh, which is quite prominent in, in, in some games where you sort of feel like, okay, as soon as you touch a thing once, it sort of just uh, disassembles into all its pieces. So it retains a bit of structure and that was sort of how that was achieved. And on the, uh, on the simulation side, inside the engine, it was sort of uh, all North Light driven, all in-house uh, software driven, basically the data and hierarchy handling, the breaking logic and what events and particles were spawned uh, around all that kind of process. And then uh, internally, it was physics um, that did the simulation of the rigid bodies and the constraint, uh, constraints. Now the destruction tool chain, how to create all that was, again, you wouldn't say like, oh, that's kind of pretty standard. So we have the geometry that comes in. We had to do a bit of model prep. In some cases, we created some sort of bonding geometry that would say, hey, these parts here of the thing can break and these parts can't break. And that went then into a destruction tool inside Houdini. That's a, a pretty big sort of HDA kind of setup um, that would then do the whole material based breaking of everything and uh, write out the data to disk. And sometimes you had to manually patch some of the physics metadata to just make sure some of the settings are correct, especially when it be did more complex things that contained uh, joints and that kind of stuff. Uh, certain values had to be uh, set manually in there. And then that went into the engine, that metadata and the mesh uh, data sort of was used by the engine to then create the world and uh, simulate it. And the destruction tool looked a bit like this. So you had an input geo that comes in like this concrete kind of block. Uh, and then uh, we were sort of defining was which areas can break, which is those two wing shaped kind of things on the side. And then uh, it decided, oh yeah, it's concrete, it's tagged as concrete. So it would do the concrete breaking and operate it through and uh, sort of create all the different hierarchies that come out of that in terms of vendor end collision geometry and make sure that this is sort of all um, within the metrics and the style that we kind of wanted to. It would add all the decals and decals would add like rebars in terms of for the concrete part, for example, et cetera. And it would do that for wood, glass, concrete and all the other materials that uh, were supported by it. And I would export into engine and then engine, it looks like this. You end up with the hierarchy. It's literally a hierarchy of nodes, and they are, uh, you know, ABC level uh, under a chunk. And uh, the name dr drove what the material would be, and uh, also other things about if they were static or not, and some things about the joints and uh, the type of joints and all those kind of things. And uh, so yeah, so the hierarchy was represented by the by the layers, by the by the sort of the depth. Um, in the hierarchy and the physics properties were driven by naming convention material assignments and uh, all the physics then would be driven off uh, that kind of stuff by the engine when it was set up named 
uh, so correctly as well. Um, and uh, you know that's something I'm going to get back to later on. Um, yeah, and then it looked like this basically. Uh, this is the uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is the uh, rigid body video um, showing that scenario again, just. Uh, we had the rigid body simulations, so uh, just using the shooting, and then we had this little tool you click on things and then they just explode. So that's what I'm doing here, um, basically just uh, 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 destroying everything. And you kind of see this is sort of, you know, physics sim is happening, it looks a little bit empty, but this is all the rigid body stuff that is actually happening in the scenario. So now some uh, things about optimizations. Uh, uh, on the site, especially when it comes to rigid bodies. Well, at any point in time, we only had about 200 active rigid bodies on screen because that's our our sort of the the budget we had to operate on uh, to make it run on consoles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, that meant that we sort of uh, kind of started culling things that were off screen and make them uh, disappear. Um, there was a collision delay on big events, so whenever there were big forces, uh, uh, sort of impulse waves implemented, that would essentially disable the self collision on objects for a bunch of frames. Um, to uh, make sure that you don't do too crazy collision cal calculations of objects that are fast moving in very close proximity to one another uh, because you don't really need it because if you put an impulse uh, somewhere it usually means it's quite clear where things are moving and mostly in an explosion they move apart so you're not really interested in those collisions so that's why i've used collision delay um well the term collision delay itself i know from the film world as well we did about the same things it helps a lot with other issues like self-intersections and stuff as well um, and then we used the sleeping thresholds a lot. So, uh, um, uh, and well, luckily, if things made of concrete and drop onto the floor, they can fall asleep really quickly. No one would expect them to bounce around a lot. Um, and uh, funnily enough, the more realistic you go, the more you can actually uh, bank on the whole sleepiness. So you don't have a lot of bounce when you drop something on the floor. It really has to be marbles <laughs> to really have them uh, uh, sort of do uh, do a longer uh, a longer lifetime across the floor or something. Um, so we had a really, really high uh, sleeping threshold. And it's also the reason that we could reliably stack objects on top of each other, which is actually quite fun uh, when you do that in game. Well, and then, of course, we filled in the blanks with a lot of particles, which brings me to the next section, um, which is uh, the particle simulation that we did is everything is systemic and event driven, right? So uh, the particle events that we have a bullet impact. So you shoot a thing, something happens. That's what is, that is driven by the material, what will happen, what particles to sort of play back. We had bond breaking. So when chunks disconnect, rigid body chunks disconnect, they would have a bond breaking event where particles would be released, which is nice because then you have like cracking, uh, uh, you know, cracking concrete sort of pebbles and all that kind of stuff you can do with it. And then the despawning. So whenever we actually made objects disappear, we didn't just pop them off, we actually made them disappear um, in sort of uh, by breaking into, into particles that were predetermined based on their material, which if you would see them despawn on screen, you would actually see them sort of feel like they're breaking apart. Uh, and that was very, very effective to sort of hide that kind of optimization. And um, uh, this is uh, here, uh, just a quick view on how we edited particles. This was all done uh, sort of with a live edit, it's a hot loaded live edit. This is the game running and you can place down a specific uh, particle system and then you can go in and change things. And I'm really just going in here, uh, changing like the emission frequency for the sparks. And I think I'm like, oh, maybe if that is actually too many sparks, maybe I go down on that and then I change and add um, a lot more rocks to the simulation. Uh, and the cool thing is you can literally play it back uh, live. Uh, uh, so you really get an instant feedback and then you can go around and shoot a thing and see how it feels like and then go back and keep iterating. And that, that really fast paced iteration loop really allowed us to polish that kind of stuff very, very, very much um, until it really sort of felt about right. Uh, and that was very, very beneficial. Uh, another specific, specific part about the particles is uh, standard simulation, but we also hijacked the rendering SDF at times. So you could optionally collide with the SDF which is, well, so much faster than colliding with anything else. <laughs> and um, that sort of took care of a lot of the particle collisions, not to have things either fall through the floor or look really weird. Um, so we use that. Now, uh, this part here now uh, would be the particles uh, and the rigid bodies at the same time. Um, so now it's the same thing as before, I was shooting and then I'm going around and just exploding everything and you, you notice instantly, oh my god, this is like so much more responsive and so much more fun because there's stuff happening, there's dust in the air, uh, it makes it instantly much richer um, and that sort of, uh, well, it's all for the additional particle layer sort of that fills in that missing, that gap in that gradient of granularity um, that is now covered by that. 
And the last aspect is material decals. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of them, we dynamically spawn them. So if something breaks, it would sort of spawn sort of ground decal of like broken shards or sort of the kind of stuff on the floor. Or if you slam the floor, it would crack the floor by decal. Uh, they were generally generated um, sort of in Houdini or a, a substance or things like that. And uh, we could dynamically spawn them based on the material they happened on as well. Uh, and that sort of helped to really also include the quite big portion of static geometry you saw it in the beginning. There's like a lot of kind of static stuff around. Uh, but as soon as you provide an impact on that, uh, it really makes a difference. And this is how that looks like, right? So, you, you know, if you hit the floor, it still is just a single <laughs> single polygon uh, um, or like a single quad. But it, it really looks uh, much different when, uh, when you start adding decals. I mean, decals are kind of awesome in general. And uh, yeah, we could sell all kinds of effects on that. And um, it's quite surprising how much you get away with although you don't really have a lot of texture budget, even just a few of them really instantly make something uh, sort of connect to a destructive element, like throwing something on the wall and then you kind of have a dent in there, although, you know, it's concrete, it wouldn't really make a dent, but it sort of helps with making it feel just about right. And we're talking superpowers, right? So, and that's now when everything comes together. So we have uh, the particles, the RBDs and the decals. And uh, I had to you know, trick a little bit because just the explosion tool wouldn't actually spawn that many decals. So I think I started to launch uh, uh, something up in the air. Like I think I take a chair and throw it. Uh, and then you kind of see that I make a dent in the floor and the floor still is just static geometry, but the decals make it so much better. And uh, yeah, this is sort of filling the last bit on that missing gradient. And uh, the other part is custom props and hazards. There are a lot of like things you can throw around, like computers and lamps and stuff like that, that wouldn't be fully procedural generated. They needed some more custom events and custom things that uh, sort of artists created um, to make uh, just feel rich. So you have the fire extinguisher that you know obviously can't be uh, can't be missing. Same as a computer having sparks and all those kind of things, and the cable attached to it and stuff like that. So lessons learned. Uh, the four main things I want to talk about is the, the well, quality of geometry of input data, because procedural is driven by data, so it's all about that. Name-based convention, kind of the same, the alley, really. Monolithic destruction tools and performance monitoring. Uh, so the four items I really want to pick. And the first thing, quality of geometry. Well, that is a problem I've dealt with uh, my entire career in film and now in games. Inconsistent incoming geometry. And it can go with while it's scaled the wrong way, uh, the orientation is wrong, but it can also be the material assignments are wrong, you know, something that is actually looks like wood, but it's sort of tagged as plant or it's tagged as flesh or something. Um, uh, but sometimes also the mesh quality being too low, and that could mean that the subdivisions aren't nice or it's sort of weirdly single-sided and that kind of stuff. Sometimes you break things and realize, well, there's nothing inside. But there should be something inside because we can break it. And that's that's sort of a difficult part of communicating standards and making that all work. And obviously we're using procedural tools uh, uh, to, to break that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so it has to be of a certain way. And uh, what can you do to fix it is improve the incoming data, standardize uh, cross DCC geometry pipeline, making sure that everything is sanity checked at export. So at export, the, the, the exporter would say, hey, this doesn't fulfill the criteria it needs to fulfill, please fix it before you export. And that would sort of help a lot uh, to avoid that, that constant feedback loop between different departments even, um, and uh, sort of put the problems exactly where they actually caused it can be fixed at the same time. Um, also, what would be good to have embedded tools to simplify the setup. So you literally have someone who's modeling a prop, being able to instantly see what it would look like if it gets destroyed. But obviously that puts a lot of strain on creating more tools with more user-friendly interfaces and all that kind of stuff. And that is a lot of work. Um, and then you sort of have to find the right trade-off for that. But we are definitely looking into that kind of thing. Uh, Name-based conventions. Uh, well, we name things that then get interpreted to be something specific. Um, and the issue with that is names can be wrong. There are obviously, apparently there are 17 different ways how you can spell concrete, for example. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's not really to blame anyone because if it's a manual thing that artists have to do, uh, it, it just, it, it's a given that there will always be a certain percentage of data that is just not correct. And you can also not express a, a lot of the range that you'd need in especially physics definition stuff uh, with just naming things. And uh, yeah, and then the mesh hierarchy might not be standard conform because you know what happens if you do things in Maya, you shuffle things around and you, you do all kinds of operations on it and then your hierarchy just goes bust. Um, so while well, all I can say about this is don't ever do name-based conventions, abandon them, use physics authored straight in the DCC. So make people tag things directly where they need to be tagged. Um, and for that, you probably need some kind of unified metadata API. So from whatever tool the artists are using to creating their props, they are able to actually author that type of data and information as well. So you don't have a translation process in between. You literally export the data that you want to export um, straight where it's being created. 
uh, monolithic distraction tool that's more almost like a Houdini specific thing but in, in general well you don't want to have the one tool that does it all um, and quite quite often it happens with you start with one thing and then you start adding something and start adding something and the more you add the more powerful it gets and the slower and harder it gets to maintain and very inflexible. Uh, the answer to that is you've got to be more granular, but more granular comes with lots of challenges because uh, we're, looking, we're looking at a lot of individual interchangeable components and uh, the problem is you have to maintain them somehow. You need to make sure that you version them correctly. You need to make sure that uh, even two years into a project, you can open something from the beginning of the project and you're still able to sort of work with that. Uh, uh, although the tool might have changed 20 times in between. So for us, it means an improved standardized HDA management that we're now operating on, making sure that everything is namespace and everything is properly uh, uh, sort of um, distributed within the artist. So you will never actually lose any type of version of a tool. You will always be able to rerun something that you did in the past. Um, especially for long production cycles, it's very crucial. And uh, also what is important that you're making tools that you can fully automate and you just run them, but actually use exactly the same tool if you would do it manually. Um, so there aren't actually any differences in them. And that will really, that is very flexible then for you to say, hey, actually this is automated really nice, but then I go in and tweak it and do something different to it in the places where you need it, those 10% of the cases where you kind of need to do something with it. But they, as long as they have the same backend, everything should be consistent and that is quite important. Now, performance and testing is almost the biggest aspect of it. Um, we uh, had no automated testing or functionality. So it was really like you put something in the level, you run around, you shoot it a bunch of times and you see if it works. And that's kind of nice. Uh, but then something changes in the engine, the backend changes, something's being optimized. And all of a sudden you have to kind of retest. And that is very dangerous because you will always forget something to test. Uh, and the effort is quite big. So you will have a potential aggression over time. And that is something that needs to be improved uh, to make sure that we don't run into this kind of problem. The second part is performance testing. Uh, so we don't have any tangible metrics. Like what do you, it's like, you know, you can't really go by FPS. Uh, it's not as easy as that or like milliseconds spent on calculation because it's not a thing that you constantly do in every frame. Right, so it's a you got it. You can optimize for a specific scenario, but it doesn't really cover what everything is. And uh, so quite often, performance issues only flared up when they were spotted. It has to do with well, we make the props breakable, and then they're being put into the level. And you know, sometimes the props are so nice they're being put into the level a lot, and all of a sudden you end up with areas that have. Uh, um, sort of lots of props, desks, computers placed, and then, well, someone in gameplay, it's a bunch of enemies that throw grenades, and then you are in a pickle. And But you don't want to actually make everything break a little bit less nice just because of that. So somehow you need to find a way how to deal with this, uh, uh, especially then that you can only react to the full picture very late in the project. And the, the two things that we kind of can do about this maybe is better performance metrics. Uh, so be able to sort of, even if it's magic numbers, something that falls out of the system that gives you some number, which means if it's bigger, it's worse, if it's lower, it's better. Uh, you can then start optimizing against that kind of stuff. And also to use those magic numbers to establish production boundaries, sort of like a physics bandwidth. Because saying, oh, it's 200 rigid bodies is too coarse. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad if you have more than 200. It's only bad if you have more than 200 and three hand grenades. And that's that kind of stuff is something that needs to be balanced out correctly. But if you have that kind of metrics, you can push the boundaries a little bit more. Uh, and the second part is automated testing that will help with that as well. And an automated assessment of assets through a testing environment. Um, so you can diff outputs and see the impact of engine changes. Another thing that can be done is just performance issue countermeasures. Uh, so maybe something that can adjust the physics performance at runtime. And obviously you can't change those distraction hierarchies necessarily, but you could say, hey, maybe this guy goes from breaking into level two straight into breaking into particles and despawn and not into another level because, oh my God, mayhem is already happening, hand grenades everywhere. And um, so that's one part of it. Uh, but for that, actually, it would be good to actually have better physics performance metrics, because uh, right now it's very hard to get that kind of information really out of physics, for example. And then the second part, well, zoning of areas based is expected to load. That's an idea sort of to say, hey, you know, you might not have known that in the beginning, but now we have an area with lots of really awesome breakable props and we have guys and hand grenades and what do we like enemies and hand grenades, what do we do? And maybe you could put a box around this and say, hey, in here, you know, heavy load physics, maybe, you know, ignore the last level of destruction hierarchy or stuff like that. Uh, and that would sort of help us to manually zone certain things where we know things could get bad um, to avoid having to downgrade all the assets uh, uh, for the entire game just because of a certain area. Um, and that, that could be another thing that could be done about this. Well, to a conclusion, to come to the end, um, well, controls reception was very well. Uh, it has generally been quite liked and especially been quite liked for its destructive environments and for the feel of launching an object 
into a bunch of desks and enemies and have everything go to bits. Um, so I think we are quite happy uh, uh, that we achieved this. Um, the workflow held up better than expected almost. So it is, uh, it went really, really well considering the small team that we had. And uh, we are quite happy that this actually worked. And we are quite inspired and excited to see where we can take this one next. And uh, what remains for me to say is thank you uh, to Matti Hemmelainen, who did uh, the greater part of the destruction uh, workflow, the destruction tool, and all that kind of stuff. And then Sami Akarainen on the north side, side doing all the physics uh, programming, and Daniel Forsberg for the particles and also the render side, but also the entire VFX department um, at Remedy that sort of obviously partook in all the different moving parts of control and made it, made it what it is today. So thank you to them, and thank you for tuning in.